Hey everyone. So we've made quite a number of videos by now and there are a couple of topics that I've read up on that I didn't really know much about before. And one thing I notice is that there's this name that keeps turning up. Often when I looked at historical topics or um, at languages and I didn't really know anything about that name. It was often just sort of on the side of a map or, you know, the end of a paragraph. And it made me curious and I figured we could have a look at what that name means, who it refers to. And that mysterious group is the Scythians. Right, Mishka's gonna get comfortable and I'll show you an example of what I mean. So this is the Putzka Historische Weltatlas that I've used a couple of times. I really, really like this book. But it has a bit of a focus on European history, which makes sense, it's for a German audience. But that means that some aspects that I didn't learn about in school also don't really turn up in here. So, here we have the world in the Bronze and Iron Age. We have Egyptians, Assyrians, Babylonians, all things I learned about. And right here for the first time we have the Scythians, north of the Black Sea. That's about 3,000 years ago. And if we turn it over, so this is 3,000 to about 2,500 years ago. We have again Egypt, there's Mesopotamia, here we have Anatolia, the Black Sea, Caspian Sea, and have a look who's here, right around the coastline of the Caspian Sea, the Scythians. We have Greek and Phoenician colonies all the way around the Mediterranean up to the Black Sea and of course to the north we have Scythia. And I just find it kind of amusing how it's really... If you look at this here, this is the Empire of Alexander the Great. It barely fits on the map, but there they are, the Scythians. And, you know, at this point we've already come to expect them here north of the Black Sea. But if we look over here, we also have Scythians all the way across in Asia. So, Central Asia here, east of the Aral Sea. We get to the Roman Empire. The area where they would be here is superimposed with an extra map of Gallia. And then eventually, basically the point where they disappear from the maps would be here around 1700 years ago. Here we are more than 2000 years ago, we still have them here. Scythians, and then if we jump forward, we can see that the Goths moved in at this point. So, 
around 1,700 years ago, the Scythians disappeared. But before that, they were around for a really long time. You know, there's a, a thousand years, basically, and across a really vast area. And I just really thought it was odd that they keep turning up, but always sort of on the side of the map and never as the main aspect. If we go forward another couple of pages, we get one hint here of who they were. This is about languages, about 2,500 years ago. And you can see here it says Indo-Germanen. So it was an Indo-European language that the Scythians spoke. Most likely an Iranian language. And that maybe explains why they turned up in Central Asia. The theory is that they come from this area here, probably like South Siberia, from the open grasslands, and from there they moved all the way to what is today Ukraine. When I was preparing this video, I watched a lecture online. I'll link it down in the description box. And in the lecture, I really like the description of these grasslands because it's a belt across, basically all the way across Asia into Eastern Europe. And, you know, everything's open and it's almost like when you're there, the landscape draws you forward. You just want to keep going. There's no border. And I don't know if the Scythians thought of it like that, or if they had more practical reasons to keep going. But at least it's, you know, relatively easy then to move across this flat, open land. We know of the Scythians that they were skilled riders, they had a lot of horses, so it was probably quite easy for them to move across. have a closer look on this 3D map of Europe. We've looked at this before. When we looked at a different aspect of Eastern European history, at Veliki Novgorod up here. And I already mentioned back then how it was quite amazing for me to realize how flat Eastern Europe is. And unfortunately, I don't have a world map in this style, but you can imagine that it just continues here through Kazakhstan eastward. And so the Scythians moved into this area. But earlier we said on one of those maps, they also turned up here along the Caspian Sea. And that's because for a while they kind of moved back. They, you know, I mean, they weren't horses, they just moved around a lot. So they moved here north of the Caucasus, crossed the Caucasus, and also reigned here into Anatolia and along the Caspian Sea here in the south. It didn't last too long though. They were eventually pushed back and returned to what in a way was at this point the homeland, the Pontic steppe, north of the Black Sea, in what is today Ukraine. A 
if we look closer at the land, we can see here that you have the Carpathian Mountains, which form a natural border. Although some of the Scythians did continue all the way in what would today be Hungary. The highest mountain here in modern Ukraine would be on the Crimean Peninsula. And of course the Caucasus was quite the obstacle to cross with the Elbrus here. 5,642 meters, depending on where exactly you draw the line between Europe and Asia, the highest mountain in Europe. If the Elbrus is not included in Europe, it would be the Mont Blanc, 4,810. That's quite a difference. In this area here, we have a lot of rivers, most notably the Dnipro, running right through the center of Ukraine, through Kyiv up here. Over here is the Don, and over here the Dniester. And you have settlements all the way further south to the Danube Delta. Now here's the thing with the Scythians. They were largely nomadic, so what they had was easy to move. They didn't build big houses, they didn't fortify anything, all of their possessions could be loaded onto a wagon and they moved along with their horses. They also didn't write down anything, so we don't know any of their stories, we don't know what they called themselves. Scythian is a name that we know from the Greeks. We've already noticed that we're in the age of ancient Greece. If you've learned history the way I learned it in school, it was Egypt, Mesopotamia, Greece, and then Rome. So if that helps you with sort of putting things into perspective, we're in the age of ancient Greece. And we've also just seen on the other map that the Mediterranean wasn't a border like on here. You know, the world didn't end where Europe ends. The Mediterranean was right at the center. And of course, the Greeks also moved into the Black Sea, which was accessible by water. They had their colonies, partly along the southern coast, but also up here. There are places like Alvea, Vidosha, or Panticapaeon on the Crimean Peninsula. And so unsurprisingly they came into contact with the Scythians. And they didn't just have contact with the Scythians, they also established a lot of trade. This here is a wonderful region to grow crops. And that's what a lot of the Scythians did and they exchanged that with the Greeks for, for example, luxury goods or wine. The Scythians were known to drink quite a lot and they drank undiluted wine, which to the Greeks must have looked quite barbaric. They apparently also smoked weed and were tattooed, so that was quite impressive to learn. And you can see why the Greeks were a bit, you know, wary of them. 
they thought of the Scythians as really quite fearsome. What we know of the Scythians basic, basically comes from Herodotus. And he said their settlements went all the way from the Danube to the Don. He said that around Albia in this region they grew crops like I said, grain, lentils, onions, garlic. Between the Nister and the Dnieper they used to plow. And around the river Geros they were nomadic. I'm not quite sure which river that refers to. It might be one of the side rivers of the Don, but I couldn't find an exact location for it. One interesting aspect here is that when it comes to the plow Scythians right here, they might actually have been some kind of proto-Slavic uh, population. When we talk about Scythians today, or really any ancient um, group or ethnic group, it's easy to sort of superimpose our idea of what an ethnicity or an identity is. We think of them as, you know, you have a homogenous group with one language, one culture, specific customs. But back then, the borders weren't as clear and it might have been a lot messier. As an example, if we think of France with its specific borders, specific culture and where everyone speaks French, that is not something that happened naturally. That took centuries and centuries of work to create this kind of um, a nation state. And of course back then with the Scythians that hadn't happened yet. And the fact that the Greeks referred to everyone west of the Rhine as Celtic and everyone east of the Rhine as Scythian also gives us an idea that this was probably an umbrella term with quite a lot of different groups living under that umbrella. But I think we can move on to a more detailed map now. So let's switch this out. I recently came across this wonderful catalogue. It's called Gold as Kiev, Gold from Kiev. And it's from an exhibition at the Art History Museum here in Vienna. I bought a second hand from someone's private collection. And the book looked like it had never been opened. It's really in a fantastic uh, condition. And it makes some nice sounds when you open it. So it says here in the introduction, in 1992 there was a first and very intense contact between basically the Art History Museum and their Ukrainian colleagues in Kyiv. And they put together this exhibition within a year, it was shown in 1993. And of course, at the time, that was quite exciting. And a time of great change in Europe. Generally, if you're interested in history, 
I think museum catalogs can be a wonderful resource. It can take some time to find all the ones, but it's definitely worth it. This one, for example, has quite a long introduction, both on the Scythians and other aspects of Ukrainian history. So we want to jump to the back. specific map right here. So we have Ukraine, there's the Danube Delta that we've mentioned, the Dnipro, here's the Don and the Black Sea where you would move across to the Caucasus. We have Olbia right here that we mentioned earlier. There's Neapol, another one of those old cities. And what we see are some of the descriptions that we have from Herodotus. The different groups of Scythians, like right here, the royal Scythians. They probably ruled over the other one. It is said that they considered all the other groups to be slaves to them. It was probably the king that was sort of the highest one among the different groups. You have nomadic groups. You have uh, Hellenistic groups. And you can see here different groups of Scythians identified by different names and as you move north you go from the sea and the coastline across the steppe to the forests and I really like how you can see how many rivers there are Herodotus described the land as very fertile, plenty of fish, plenty of grain, really great water that was very clear with lots of fish. So it sounds like a beautiful place to live back then. And these little pyramids that we have here, these give us an idea of what the Scythians were actually like. Like I said, they didn't leave us any writing or any stories, or we have other descriptions coming from the Greeks and you don't really know how accurate those were. But these here are Kurgans, the burial mounds. So they also give us some archaeological traces and you can see nicely where they settled from the Crimean Peninsula here across to along the river Kuban to the Don but mostly along the Dnipro north illustration of what these Kurgans look like. You had a wooden structure on the ground and then a type of pyramid on top. And depending on the person that was laid to rest there, 
find a lot of additions. If they were kings, they would be buried with their servants and their horses. And the fascinating part is, you can find these Kurgans not just in Ukraine, but all the way across into Siberia, which is why people can assume that those were probably related groups. We also have a lot of gold work from the Scythians, parts of which were found in these uh, Kurgans. And some of them give us an idea of what they look like. Here, for example, they're usually depicted with these long beards and long hair. Of the fringe they have. They wore trousers because they were riding horses, which I hope I'm remembering this correctly. The Greeks thought were a bit weird. And oftentimes in depictions, you can also see them wearing coney caps. They don't have them on here. There's a close up of their faces. It's pretty impressive how detailed this is. We don't really know who these two guys are. There were two more on the back of this item, but you can see it's quite worn. One theory is that it might depict their origin story. There are two versions. One is as narrated by the Greeks. It says that Heracles moved into what would become Scythia, but at the time was an empty land where no one lived. It was in winter and very cold, and when he stopped to rest, he fell asleep and his horses disappeared. So he went across the land searching for the mares, and he came across a mythical person who was half woman, half snake. She said she had his horses, but she would only return them if he slept with her. And well, Heracles really wanted his horses, so he did what she asked. And I guess it was quite a successful trade. She became pregnant with three sons and he got his horses back. And then this half woman, half snake person asked what to do with the three sons once they were grown up. And so this Heracles said, when you see the boys are grown up, do as follows and you will do rightly. Whichever of them you see bending this bow and wearing this belt so, make him an inhabitant of this land. The first two sons didn't do it correctly when they were grown, but the third one did. And he inherited the land. And he was named Scythes, so that gave the name to the entire people, the Scythians. The Scythians themselves had a bit of a different story. At least that's what 
Herodotesis. Again, it's about three sons in a place that's as of yet uninhabited. But they were the sons of Zeus and a daughter of the river Nipro. When they were grown up, they saw that some items fell from heaven. A plough, a yoke, a sword and a flask. They were all made of gold. But when the first son went there to pick these items up, the gold was still hot and it burned him. And the same happened with the second son. The third son, however, managed to pick up the four items. And everyone agreed that the royal power would go to him. So it's a similar story but with some different elements. We can see one of the bows here. And it said that these Scythians also dipped their arrows in poison, so you can imagine that they were quite feared. Here we have an example of what women possibly wore. These might have been from priestesses at the time. This is quite common here, these gold plates that were sewn onto their fabrics. You can see how many of them there are. All really beautifully worked with lots of details. example here of two different people becoming blood brothers and I particularly like this scene we have one female figure sitting down here holding probably a mirror and then a young male figure drinking out of a cup. It might show power being given to a young man from a goddess. But that's up to interpretation. He might also just be uh, enjoying his undiluted wine. And then the last item I'd like to show you is this one. This is just absolutely gorgeous and it shows how incredibly skilled the craftsmen were at the time. We can open this up. And we get an idea of everything that was important to the Scythians. And we have bow and arrow next to these two figures. I'm not sure what they're holding in the middle. Maybe it's a sheepskin. But again we can see their trousers that they're wearing. And we can see these beautifully worked, realistic horses. This one might be scratching itself with a back hoof. 
absolutely love the way the mane's falling across head and neck. There's a fall here with its legs tucked under. And another one here with its mother. And here are plenty of birds and flowers. If we turn it over, we have some mythical figures. These are griffins attacking a horse with these really detailed wings Here we have a cow peeking around and the sheep and I really love the way the wool is worked on here with these little circles Again, the grip a lion, dogs, and a rabbit, the goats up here, so almost all the animals that they had in their vicinity, I do hope they didn't have any actual griffins. You can even see the individual claws and these expressive faces. Beautiful examples here, which were on display back then. So that's the story of the Scythian lasted for over a thousand years. They even fought against Darius the Great and the Macedonians, the son of Alexander the Great. And eventually they probably assimilated and became part of the Gothic people. Slavic peoples moving in. But they did leave their beautiful treasure.